My neighborhood is on fire currently. I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, the fires that are going up north in Santa Rosa. It's, uh, they say it's the worst fire in Northern California's history. I have um, at least a dozen friends who have lost their homes. If you look, my friend sent me this video and, um, and it's him driving in a neighborhood for, for five minutes and his phone is faced to the horizon line. And this is like suburban neighborhood with a house every you know, quarter acre or so, cul-de-sacs. And there's just nothing there. There's just some old chimneys and some, uh, and some trees that are black and like the remains of trees. It's a, it's a crazy perspective shift for you. You know, my house right now has like ash falling on it, like chunks of ash like this big falling from the sky. Anyways, I was talking to a friend about it and he said to me, he said, um, wow, that fire was efficient. You know, it started at about 12 a.m. and it took out 20,000 acres in, uh, by 7 a.m. Right, so a whole neighborhood's just gone. And, um, and I, I find that a really curious thought process. And I think it's a thought process that many of us hold, which is that speed is efficiency, right? right? Wow, they started a company and got to $100 million in two years. That was an efficient process, right? I've transformed really quickly, and so I was efficient in my transformation. And, and we don't want to really think about the logical inconsistency there. Right? How quickly we learn is, an, is considered an efficiency. But if you really think of the fire for a second, what you'll see is that it was extremely inefficient. The amount of fuel that it took to destroy and the amount of resources that it left behind was just an insanely inefficient method of destruction. Right? A more efficient method would be something that maybe took 10 years, but all the resources were reused and recycled. Right? And it's similar for us. What we think is efficiency is speed, and we never really think about effort as that form of efficiency. Right? We never think to ourselves, oh, wow, I you know, learned the law, and I did it with you know, almost no stress, and I did it without staying up at night and I did it with ease, I enjoyed myself the whole time. And that's, the, that's really the key for, for the human experience, the key for understanding if we're being efficient is our enjoyment of the process. And our brain, it works like this in a lot of ways. We have, you know, there's these things called optical illusions, which basically says neurologically we can't see things as they are, and so with certain patterns our brain gets tricked. But this is also the way our mind works. There are certain patterns that trick our mind, and then we can't see things clearly. And this is one of those things, that efficiency. The other one that I want to bring into attention and that we're going to spend a lot of the time with today is that we all think about what we're going to do, but we don't really think about how we're going to be as a form of getting things done. And I, I mean getting things done. I don't mean, hey, I was on Facebook the other day, and it was this, um, this guy had posted this question, and the question was, um, should I focus on the future and making my future better, or should I focus on being here now? And my brain just rattled with that. I was like, how is there a difference between these things? But that's what the brain does. The brain says that there's this difference between um, working for the future and being present. And I don't know if you've ever like tried to harness one of these non-dual enlightenment teachers, but they're scheduled for like two years out. Like, right? They're like, oh, I'll be here now, and I've got a schedule to keep, and, and then my time is completely taken. And so it's this weird thing that our brain likes to create these either-or options for us. And, and an either or option that we often have and that we often think about is to do, we have to be doing, and our sense of being doesn't really affect it. 
And that's what we're going to question today. We're going to do experiments with it today to really get to understand the difference. And so I, I want to I hear something that everybody thinks is a receptive activity. It's a form of being, and it's listening. Right? That's something that you guys, not you guys, but most people, they think, like, if I'm listening, then I'm in more of a being state and less of a doing state. But that's actually not true at all. And I want to give you a little bit of an experiment right now just to, to kind of whet your appetite for what's possible. So you, you're all listening to me right now. And, and here's how I want you to listen to me. I want you to cross your arms. And I want you to think, wow, man, this guy's full of shit. That's what I want you to think about. And I want you to prove that I'm full of shit in your mind. I want you to think about all the ways that I am not consistent, that I'm not right. So, that, that, so I'm going to say something, I'm going to talk for like two or three minutes, and I want you to be in a completely critical state of mind. Talking right? to your shirt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Perfect. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. So I want you to, I mean, if you're into Donald Trump, then listen to me like I'm Obama. If you're into Obama, listen to me like I'm Donald Trump. You're just trying to figure out how wrong I am. Okay, so that's, that's it. And let me like bring something up so that you guys can really test that form of listening with me. Okay, so uh, let's see here. So what people often think is that knowing is more important than the question, right? You're gonna go outside and you're gonna go through these booths and these booths are gonna tell you, they're not gonna ask you a question, they're gonna tell you what they do. See, I know something, I got something, you can have it, I've got it, this is the important way of being, but they're, they're not ever thinking about the right question. Are you guys still critical of me? It's really hard to not like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't think that I'm smug and arrogant. <laughs> um, so, Right? Yeah, so we're, in the, we're, not ever, we're thinking about what we're going to say, we're thinking about what we're going to do, we're not thinking about the question that we're asking. Like, go to any of those booths and find out how many people show up and say, you know, at the booth, say, so what makes you interested in stopping at the booth? Right? And the thing about the right question is the right question leads to the right answer. So you can say, if I'm going to build, say, like a cell phone, I can say, I want to build a cell phone that sells the most. That's one question. How do I do it? Another question would be, you know, how do I build a cell phone that's most easy to use? And they're going to produce two different cell phones. So the question is really, really important. And we're often thinking about what we know and not what we don't know when we talk and when we talk to each other. Okay. So that was some little speech. You guys all got to be critical of me. And that's an act of doing. It's an activity that you're doing. All right, so now I'm going to see what it's like, or we're going to experiment a little bit with what it's like to not do that. So now when, I, when you're listening, I want you to listen to the silence in the room. So there's silence. Wow. Can you feel that? Um, there's silence between my words. That's one silence you can listen to. The other silence that you can listen to is that my voice has got certain vibrations that are happening, but there's a whole bunch of vibrations around my voice that are silent, even with the hum. So I just want you to pay attention. To who cares what I'm saying? You don't have to worry about it. Just pay attention to the silence that's happening. And I'm going to talk about something else for a minute. And you just pay attention to the silence. Don't worry about me. So my, um, my daughter, she's eight years old, and her teacher house burnt down. And this is her story, my, my daughter's teacher's story. She had the windows shaking and the doors popping. And so she woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning, went outside to see what was going on. Her backyard was on fire. She put it out with a garden hose to notice that there was flaming balls going through the sky. And one of the flaming balls hit her neighbor's house, and the house was gone inside of 10 minutes. She thought, maybe it's time to leave. Are you guys still listening to the silence? It doesn't matter what I'm saying. Yeah. So that's the difference in being 
and doing, right? That, that's the difference. And you can just feel it in the whole room right now if, you, if you're paying attention. And so when we come to this conference, we think to ourselves, well, what am I going to learn, which is a form of doing, or who am I going to meet, which is a form of doing, or how am I going to pitch myself, which is a form of doing? But probably very few of us thought to ourselves, how are we going to be while we're at the conference? And what's an interesting mental experiment to do, just for a second, is to think you meet somebody at the conference, and that person is listening to you the way you listen to me at first, in that critical nature, trying to figure out what idea is right or wrong. And then you think about the person you meet at the conference who listens to you with making the silence the priority. And which one of those people are you going to want to do business with? Which one of those people are you going to, be, going to want to be a friend with? So the way that we are has a huge effect on our lives. Just the way we are in our being has a huge effect on our lives. What we create, what we attract, what we repel, will have a huge effect just on the being of things, not on the doing of things. OK. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to take this massive injection of um, oxytocin, and I'm going to inject it into the crowd. That's the next thing that we're going to do. And to do that, I need you to break up into fours. So you can move the chairs, do whatever you need to do to set up in, in small circles of four. So we turn up the house lights almost all the way so everybody can see what they're doing. Thanks. OK, break up into fours. Apparently, there needs to be a lot of talking to break into fours. Organization, coordination. Go ahead and move your chairs because you want to be facing one another. Get into small circles, use the corners of the room. Hey, real quick question how many of you are listening to the silence right now? Not that you can't talk, but that you're actually listening to the space. And it needs to be exactly four people, guys. So sit with people you don't know. This is a networking event. It would be a great chance to do it, but it needs to be four people. Can you guys put it so that you sit to, so you can face each other? Facing each other is really important in this exercise. Move chairs. Don't worry about the reservation signs. We'll put everything back. And just four people. Can I get a hand from anybody who needs a group? Come on up here. You need one person. The person in the back with the hand up, do you want to come up to this, this group? Yeah. This man needs a group. Who's got three? Those guys in the back have three. So if you need to rebel, and have five people in your group, it's going to be very unsatisfying. I invite you to rebel, and you can have that experience. But four people is best. All right. Again, is there anybody who hasn't found a group of four to be with? There's some chairs up here. The guy standing in the back, if you need chairs, you can come up here. Okay, let's, let's get quiet again. Are, you, you four, can you bring your chairs up here so you can face each other? Super important to face one another. Because it's going to, you're going to be doing some straight face-to-face -face work, and I need you to all be facing each other to do it. Yeah, you guys are great. You can bring your chairs up. You can use this corner of the room. Is there anybody who doesn't have a group? OK. Shh. Thanks. OK. So I want to pick the, pick the person across from you, and I want you to sit across from that person and make direct eye contact. 
and there's no talking for this exercise unless I ask you to talk. You guys standing in the back, there's chairs here. Come on up and, and put yourselves in groups of four. If you don't want to be in a group of four and you just want to talk, please leave the room because it'll be really distracting for everybody else. Yeah? I see you standing. Come on. Yeah, great. And everybody in the room, just raise your hand if you don't have a group of four. Okay. You guys, do you want chairs? Come on, it's going to be a long session. Come on. <laughs> yeah, there's, chair, there's plenty of chairs here. Okay. We have one guy here. Is it, do we have a group of three, or are there three people who want to? I see one, two. You two in the back, will you guys come forward and, and be with them, please? Yeah, great. Yeah, that's great. Just take those reserve signs off and just sit down. It's fine. They were reserved for you, as it turns out. <laughs> OK, great. OK, so you guys can sit in a circle. That'd be best. Thanks for participating. And pick a person across from you and just take, yeah, exactly. Most of you are doing it. Just create some eye contact. So what I need you to do is not have any part of your body crossed, right? So just be in a completely open position for each other and start making eye contact with one another. Clearly, it's OK to blink, but if you can <laughs> create a gaze and not let that gaze go, that would be perfect. The way the nervous system works is that when we feel like we're in connection, our nervous system settles. And when we feel out of connection, our nervous system gets jumpy. And the neurochemical of oxytocin is what calms our nervous system. And we can get that chemical through hugging one another, or making eye contact, having sex, cuddling, lots of ways to do it, most of them inappropriate in a room like this. And what happens when oxytocin runs through the system is that being gets prioritized in the neurochemistry and doing gets deprioritized. It doesn't go away, it just gets deprioritized. So this would be a really good time to listen to the silence again and turn off your phones. Yeah. And you might notice in yourself right now that there's something that's still kind of defensive. And see what it's like to let that go. See if you can receive the person across from you in a way that's just a little bit deeper. And right now, there might be a part of you that's a little bit nervous. See if that's really necessary. See what it's like to assume that the person across from you isn't judging you. That the person across from you just wants you to be who you are.
And though nobody's saying anything, see what it's like to listen even deeper to the person across from you. See if you can let go of anything that you're trying to present to the person across from you. So I'm going to talk a little bit, just keep the eye contact going. One of the things we get taught through the mental illusion of doing and being is that, and you hear it expressed in this way a lot, when I'm done meditating, I, I, it's all gone. I come into work, I see my family, and it's what, what happened to all the meditation. So we're going to do a, little, a couple of experiments that teach us that the internal meditation, the principles behind the internal meditation, and the principles behind the external meditation are the same thing. So go ahead and close your eyes. And I want you to experience what it's like to manage yourself. The state that you are in is not good enough. It's a little too constricted, it's a little too tense. I want you to try to change it. And now I want you to see what it's like internally to not manage your experience. Whatever's happening internally is just fine. It is your gift from the universe. It's exactly what you're supposed to be experiencing to learn what wants to be learned. Most people manage their experience in meditation, which isn't meditation, it's torture. So go ahead and open your eyes and create the eye contact across from you again. And see what it's like to manage the person across from you. Their back isn't straight enough. They're not smiling at me. You're trying to change who they are. I need them to like me. I need them to think I'm really smart. I need them to not hurt me. And now see what it's like to not manage them at all. To see where they are in this moment to be the perfect gift that you need. to see them as an expression of that silence that you've been paying attention to. Okay, close your eyes again.
and I want you to see what it's like internally to have empathy for yourself. Right? Empathy means that you are allowing yourself to experience the emotional state of yourself or others. It's allowing... Could you please close the door? Thank you. You're having a full empathetic experience for yourself. Right? So we typically have a voice in our head that says, I should do this, I should do that. I shouldn't have done this. And that's not an empathetic experience. The empathetic experience is um, right here with you. Whatever you're experiencing is fine. And feel that kinesthetic state for a moment. Feel what it's like to be in that empathetic state for yourself. And without going into your mind to figure this out, just do the kinesthetic opposite of that. And go into a non-empathetic state with yourself. A judging, discerning state. And go ahead and open your eyes and make eye contact with the person in front of you again. And I want you to have empathy for the person across from you. Now you, you can look in their face and you can see what's being held. You can see the neuroses. You can see the fear the pride, and instead of judging any of that, allow yourself to feel it. Feel the pain, the anguish, the happiness, and just have that full empathetic state with the person across from you. And now I want you to do the opposite. And what that means is you just created a bit of a barrier between you, or a lot of a barrier between you and the person across from you. I don't want to feel what you feel. I don't want to be with you that deeply. That could hurt. Just cut that, cut that off, see what that's like. Okay, close your eyes again. And again, just pay attention to the silence in the room. We're gonna make some adjustments, but just be silent and listen to the silence. Hey, everybody who's standing in the back, why don't you guys come up here and we'll make groups for you, with you as well. Yeah, come on up. So it's groups of four, pull the chairs out and just sit in a circle. Three right here. Oh, perfect, and you four. Um, there's chairs over in that corner and you can just grab that and then sit in a circle. Thanks for coming. I think... All right. Yeah. One there. You two, you want to come in and join us, right? Come in with this group. Just two of you, and then we can get the rest when more people come in. Are you guys still listening to the silence? Okay.
So open your eyes again and pay attention to the person across from you. And I want you to be curious about the person across from you. See what it's like to be in wonder, right? So, and not to need the answer to the question that's in your head, like, ah, oh, I wonder what made this person this way. I wonder what their early childhood experience was. I wonder what drama I've seen. Yeah. And now I want you to know something about the person across from you. They're sloppy because their shirt's untucked. Or they think they're really important with their fancy shoes. Whatever it is you think you know, see what it's like just to be in that knowing state with them. Feel what that does to your body. Right. And close your eyes again. I'm going to pose a question for you. Who do you want to be with? The person who's curious about you or the person who knows something about you? What's the biggest gift you can give to your friends, knowing something about them or being curious about them? Okay, we're going to do one more of these. I want you to be vulnerable with yourself, with your eyes closed. I want you to feel what it's like to be completely vulnerable. Vulnerability is the opposite of control. So see what it's like to be fully vulnerable with yourself and what does that feel like? Now feel what it's like to be defensive with yourself. Justify yourself. And then you open your eyes and make contact again. Don't worry, you can't do this wrong. And see what it's like to be defended with the person across from you. See what it's like to need to justify your existence to the person across from you, to defend yourself. And now see what it's like to be vulnerable with them. To show a little part of what you're scared to show. To be in a way that you're just a little scared to be. And 
uh, now I want you to think about just one thing you can say to the person across from you and to the group at large that would be vulnerable. So these are strangers or not, but vulnerability doesn't have to be something big, and it can be. Vulnerability is just something that's a little bit scary to say. This is not going to be a conversation, it's just going to be one or two sentences. Notice any anxiety that you're feeling. See what it's like to be vulnerable with that. I want one person in the group of four to raise your hand. Just one. Yep. The vulnerability is going to start with you, and then it's going to go clockwise. One or two sentences. You can lower your hands. One or two sentences, and then it passes on. Okay? So go ahead. Just one or two sentences. We're about halfway done. When you're finished sharing, just be silent. <coughs> Fantastic. We're going to come to the close in about 30 seconds. Okay, falling into silence, closing your eyes again. Yeah. Closing your eyes. So I want to share what I heard. I heard a lot of laughter. I heard a lot of warmth. I heard a conversation that was meaningful to people. So now, with your eyes closed, I want you to think of one sentence, not one and a half sentences, not a run-on sentence, not a really long sentence, just a single sentence. And this sentence is going to be the sentence that would be the most important sentence for you to share with this group. The most important thing, like you're never going to see them again. Maybe you're never even going to get to say another sentence in your whole life. It's the thing that they need to hear. The most important thing that they need to hear. the thing that you need to say. And it's one sentence. It's not one and a half. And this time we're going to start with the person across from the person who raised their hand. 
and that person is going to share the sentence, then you're going to allow some silence to lay down. There's going to be a nice pause. Everybody gets to take it in, feel it, and then the next person shares their sentence. Okay, go ahead. One sentence. And I want you to close your eyes and fall into silence again. And now I want you to say that one sentence to yourself. This is the human experience. Aren't we fortunate? So we're going to do an exercise, and for this next exercise to work, when I say shh, there has to be like absolute silence right away. And what that means is that when I say shh, the person who's talking is going to fear that they're not going to get to say everything that they want to say. And I'm here to tell you, you're going to get to keep on talking, so don't worry about it. When I say shh, you can just stop mid-sentence. Okay. So what's going to happen is one of you is going to share your vision of the world, your, your vision for your company, your vision of your life, the thing that's most important to you to be doing in the world. Right? Think of it like you're pitching almost, right? You're sharing something that you want to be doing in the world with the people around you. So that's going to be the exercise, except for I'm going to ask the people who are listening to you to listen in different ways. Right? So that's how it's going to be. So the person who is sitting to the right of the person who raised their hand, you're going to be the one sharing. So there's a person who raised a hand. If they point to their right, that's the person who's sharing. And I want the people to be listening to that person. Um, and what, how I want you to listen is I want you to listen like you're listening for the way that you can interject. I want you to listen to them. Actually, let's do a bit. I want you to listen to them like they're pitching you for money. That's how I want you to listen to them. I want you to listen to them like they want something of yours that's a limited resource. Right? That's how I want you to listen to them. Okay? So you're, you're in full discernment, judgment mode, they're going to be sharing their passion. All right? So this is going to happen for like three or four minutes. Only that one person speaks, nobody else gets to speak. Go ahead.
This isn't a joke. You really are listening to them the way you think a venture capitalist would listen. If your arms aren't crossed, you're probably not listening the right way. Yeah, that's right. Just another guy who wants your money. That person is going to keep on talking, but this time I want you to listen to them like they are Elon Musk and the Dalai Lama rolled up into the perfect human being. Right? I want you to listen to them as if they are speaking pure truth. Right? I, I'll put it to you this way: I want you to listen to them the way you have always wanted to be listened to. Okay, go ahead. One more experiment. This time, I want you to listen to them the way you listen to the silence. So, I want you to listen to them when you're paying attention not to what they're saying, but to the silence that's around their voice, that's between their words. Okay, go ahead. <laughs>
Go ahead and close your eyes for a minute. And just take a minute to reflect on how the person you were listening to spoke differently depending on how you listened to them. And if you spoke, reflect on how you spoke differently when you were listened to in different ways. And you may notice that the way that we listen creates the reality around us. The stories we hear will change. The information we get will be different. And you're going to be going through the conference for the next couple of days, and your experience is going to be based in a large part for how you, by how you listen. And the way you listen will change what you receive and what you get and the connections you get in this conference. Now, the person across from the person who just spoke, or the last person who hasn't spoken, your job is to share your passion again. But this time, the people around you can listen to you any way they want to listen to you. They can change, they can experiment, they can do whatever they want to do. It's the way that you share that we're going to be modifying, right? How you share with the people is what we're going to be tweaking. And the first thing that I'm going to ask you to do is I want you to share with the group like you need them to be convinced. You need them to be convinced because if you don't get con convince them, you won't get the money, you won't have a job, you won't be able to pay your mortgage, your kids will have to go to, you know, homeless shelters. You really need them to be convinced of what you're saying. Okay, go ahead. Okay, hold on a minute. That's just not good enough. Like, you're acting here. Don't, don't take this personally. Just really try to convince the people across from you. Okay, go ahead. There we go. Oh, God, it's not going well. You're going to lose your house, man. Oh. Shh. You guys are awesome. Thank you for... Now I want you to share with the people across from you like you are the Dalai Lama and Elon Musk all rolled into one. This is actually somewhat harder for most people to do. But I want you to share with just the complete confidence, without any need, without any expectation, with a com kind of a complete power, meaning that there's nothing that you need to prepare for or need in this situation. You can just share because it is what's moving you, what's moving through you, just to share to share. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. 
You couldn't do this wrong if you tried. No need to convince. Now the last exercise. And this one might be a little bit challenging, so take your time to get into it. I want you to share, but instead of paying attention to what you are saying or what they might be hearing, I want you to just pay attention to the silence in the room when you talk. I want you to pay attention to the space between your own voice. I want you to pay attention to the vibrations that aren't moving. Don't worry about whether it's awkward or not. Don't worry about it if you only say one or two sentences. Just make the priority paying attention to the silence. Okay, go ahead. Pay even more attention to the silence. Go ahead and close your eyes, everybody. So take a minute just to pay attention to how it was to hear the person as they went through different ways of being. How was it different, what was said differently? when they were sharing from need, or when they were sharing from confidence, or when they were sharing from silence. What did you like listening to more? What fed you more? And if you were the one speaking, what fed you more? How how are the different ways of being more or less rewarding? And keeping your eyes closed, I just want to explain something neurologically. So I told you at the beginning we were going to inject a whole bunch of oxytocin into the room, and we did that with the eye contact. And what that does, one of the results of that is it allows us to learn better because the left and right hemispheres talk with each other better. But the other thing it does is it increases our capacity for the mirror neurons to work. And so the mirror neurons are what allows us to feel what other people are feeling. 
So what's happening is the way you are, the being part of you, is being conveyed to the people across from you. So if you're conveying anxiety, they're feeling anxiety. Like most people don't like to feel anxiety. They might be addicted to it, but they don't like it. Or you're conveying confidence. Or you're conveying presence. And it's the same when you're listening. So that's the mechanism in which we're controlling our reality, in which we are creating the reality that we get to live in based on how we are being, not what we're doing. But it doesn't just work with humans, it works with our technology too. If you create your technology out of fear, that's going to be conveyed. If you create your technology with anxiety, that's going to be conveyed when people use the technology. If you create your technology with presence, that's going to be conveyed. It's so obvious when we look at art that we're feeling the emotional state of the artist. And somehow we often forget it when the artist is a technologist. Your legacy depends on how you approach, how you are when you're doing your task. That's your legacy. So let's just take a minute to enjoy the silence. All right, so the last task, this one's a little scary for me to, to see if this one works, we'll find out. I want the four of you to agree on one thing. That's the task. The four of you are gonna talk and listen with your new skills, and your job is to agree on one thing. The thing that you agree on, however, needs to be something that is pushing the boundary of the, the status quo thought process, right? So it would be pretty easy for you guys to agree, like, Trump is a this or that, or um, right-wing religious Christians are this or that but that's not really pushing the status quo of society, right? So it's something that's a little bit revolutionary, something that's a little bit pushing, right? The kind of things that people would get into arguments about. And I'll tell you, this isn't gonna work unless we can listen and speak with some of the new ways of being that we're exploring. If you need to be heard, this isn't going to work. If you need to show how smart you are, this isn't going to work. If you need to show off your credentials, it isn't going to work. If you need to be liked, it isn't going to work. But if you can prioritize the silence, if you can prioritize the empathy, the curiosity, the non-management, then anything's possible. All right, so you have 10 minutes. Go ahead.
How are you listening? How are you talking? Where's the silence? Where's the curiosity? We're about halfway done. Do -do -do. You guys can restart in a second. I just wanted to reintroduce the silence. Okay, go ahead. We have two minutes left. Okay, we'll come to a close. Can I get a show of hands as the experiment? We'll see how the experiment... How many of you groups came to a consensus on an idea or a thought process? How do we do? It's pretty good. <laughs> um, I would love to hear if you guys think you have a particularly good one that we could all. She, you, 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 you think it. There's a mic back here. If you would go and grab the mic, and we'll do like three or four of these. I'm just curious what comes out of. And as we're waiting for the mic to get to its place, I want you to think about something. How many of you guys in your life have to sit in meetings or get to sit in meetings on a regular basis? How many? Yeah. What would your life look like if the meetings were like this? What would the world look like? Hold on. What, what would the world look like if meetings were like this? 
What would we create as humanity? How successful would your company be? Yeah. Okay. Who's good idea in the back? Oh, yep, you got it. Oh, wow. You got, you got it from the really eager group. That was savvy. <laughs> it's okay, please, yeah. Uh, we decided that we needed to change the educational system in the U.S. and perhaps out to include things like teaching empathy, all the different kinds of religions around the world, um, and make education back to being fun again as opposed to dragging suitcases of books and make, having to make play dates because you've got so much work to do. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's a personal passion of mine, as it turns out. Yeah. If you guys are interested in that, one of the nonprofits I support is called Souls, Self-Organized Learning Environments, and you can go to Soul CLE, and they're doing just that. Go ahead. So we came to a consensus on a phrase that relates to an idea that scarcity is a perspective rather than a reality. Yeah, so the consensus we came to was that uh, ceremony and ritual uh, can enhance a coherence amongst humans that perhaps can lead to the fading away of government and other dissonance that we're seeing. Yeah. Our brilliant group over here discussed that masculine and femininity may be labels that actually put drapery over really seeing the person and that we think gender is entirely an anatomical designation. <laughs> We agreed to deregulate psychedelics. <laughs> but on the caveat, with the caveat that anyone who would like to participate or to partake of the psychedelic medicine be allowed to with and under clinical therapeutic set and setting. Hmm. We, uh, we talked about our appreciation for Trump, actually. No, and, and, um, and for the role that he and his actions every day are taking in waking up um, humanity and, and empowering the unfoldment that's happening uh, on the planet right now. And so it felt to us like there's not a lot of appreciation for that right now. Yeah. And, and the world needs more appreciation in general. So as much as I think we all disagreed with the actions he takes every day, the bigger picture, um, there, was, there was a sense of appreciation for how it's playing its role. I want to I make a comment about that when we've been playing with internal and external stuff. Um, that is an external... Um, movement that when it happens internally is incredibly powerful. Most of us have an emotional situation or a mind thought process that we don't appreciate because it's wreaking havoc in our lives. They often start with things like should or they start with things like I have to or I shouldn't have. Or, and if we can appreciate those the same way that we appreciate what, how you appreciated Trump, it totally transforms what's happening inside of us. That was really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Someone's got the mic, yeah. So we had the exact same conclusion as another group here, which was great. Um, our consensus was to completely reboot the educational system, and the central focus should be on um, supporting children and maintaining a connection to their natural state of being throughout their entire life. We have one up here, Mikey. Oh, I'm over there. So we discussed um, the fact that um, it may not be very beneficial to um, have expectations about someone, but it can also be detrimental to be curious about them because when you are curious about someone, in a sense, you are putting some um, uh, intention on them. You're expecting them to perform or to act um, in a certain way. 
And when you want people to be curious about you, similarly, you're putting yourself at the center of the interaction. Um, so we, mm. so we uh, agreed that it is better to let everyone be as they are and let yourself be as you are in an interaction mm. without trying to be neither curious nor deciding anything in advance about the person in front of you. Awesome. There's one up here. Uh, so we started very general and we agreed that there is a better way of living in the world. Um, and to get there, it's not about treating the symptoms, but we need a uh, shared value system across nationalities and generations. Some, maybe, yeah. So we went with the sentence that um, we all will be cyborgs in future, and we decided to agree on these controversial topics. We managed to do that, but only after um, making a very precise definition of resp socially responsible ethical cyborg. <laughs> and... Um, and also uh, taking into consideration that being a cyborg is just enhancing in a healing way, meaning merging human being and machine in, in a way that we do it right now, like pacemakers and bionic uh, prostheses for amputees and even contact lenses. Thanks. Two more. There's some people in the back with their... Yeah. I decided to tell about uh, our little conversation, which was not easy in the beginning, but it's kind of the uh, little op opposition to two previous ones, because we discussed that before saving the world, you should understand ourselves better, heal ourselves, be vulnerable, and uh, have the sense, the meaning of life ourselves. Hmm. And then the world will, or those who share it, can come and share the real truth. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah cool. We can do two more. Why don't you, Pat? Okay, we'll make sure that both of you guys get a chance. Oh, okay. I'll tell you later. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, we just, it's a perfect segue to our thing. Uh, uh, we decided to go with something more controversial, which is that narcissistic gatherings like this won't change the world. Uh, <laughs> so, that's it. <laughs> I'm curious, can they be a part of changing the world or just have uh, no, no effect of at all? We, 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 <laughs> we, we, we thought of prefacing it, but then we decided not to, to make it more controversial. So. Love it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Did, yeah. Uh, well, what came out of our conversation here um, is, uh, first of all, a reflection on the fact that the hierarchical system that has emerged in our society is not serving us well, and that there needs to be uh, a, a rekindling of the bottom-up uh, processes, and that they, in turn, involve the restoration of, of community, of the communal element, which is uh, harder and harder in our society. And then the idea came up that central to all of that is uh, uh, an atmosphere, an attitude of acceptance. Um, and then I pointed out, uh, being the elder in the group, that that actually comes easier with aging. Mm. Uh, and uh, we also realized that that's not where children are. Children are inculcated into uh, more rigid uh, thought patterns. Mm. And that may be uh, the idea of changing the educational system has been reflected several times here. Uh, that is to say, this atmosphere, attitude of acceptance uh, needs to be uh, part of the bottom-up uh, process of educating children, so yeah. that, uh, which means the educational system needs to be less competitive and, and more, uh, have more of that communal element that we're talking about. Thanks. And the last person back there. Um, our group here... Uh, agreed that there should be less or no borders of separation, lines of separation, borders, no borders, no lines of separation. Internally or externally? Uh, externally was mostly what we were talking about, countries and states and wow. all those lines, things like that. 
All right. So that was our event for this morning. This is the opening of the conference. Um, I get some, I have an opportunity for you guys, and I get a lot of questions, and I'm going to answer them in quick succession here just to save me time as I walk through the conference. Um, uh, first is, if, if it, today you go to joehudson.com, which is my website, and sign up for the email, we're going to be creating, an, we have created an online course or a beta version of an online course, which is like eight minutes a day, mostly audio with experiments like the ones we just did. So it's just every day there's an experiment. Most days there's an experiment that you can play in your life. And um, we're, if you sign up for the mailing list today, um, you can be part of the trial, and that's free. And we just request that you give feedback. So that's one thing. The other thing is as far as investments go, um, we do still make investments. Um, we do, I only work with stuff that is... Um, that has the ability to scale to a, a multi-billion dollar company in seven to ten years and uh, has uh, at its central core the awakening of humanity as its mission. So that, that's all I invest in. So if, that doesn't, if that's not relevant, please don't come and pitch me because it'll just be a waste of your time and mine. The last thing is, so I do um, facilitate groups like this. I go into Fortune 500 companies and facilitate, and I have some courses um, and, and, I, and I can't say yes to everybody who asks, but I can say yes if there's an alignment of vision um, and if there's a capacity of the person who's coming to me. So you can, go to the, you can go to my webpage and you can see what I do and how I do it and how you might want to get involved, just send an email. And then finally, what we have over here in this corner is a, a little one named Jack. And two weeks old, yeah, and, um, and I thought we could just give a little love to the, to, the, to the newborn, and I just want you to do it really gently. Two weeks is really, really sensitive, so if we could just take a minute and just give our well wishes and our blessings, our love, our support to Jack, that would be great. All right, thank you all. <laughs>